Welcome to the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Our mission is to help executives thrive as cyber risk managers. Your hosts are Kip Boyle, CEO of Cyber Risk Opportunities, and Jake Bernstein, Cybersecurity Counsel at the law firm of Newman DeWars. Visit them at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. Hi, everyone. Before we get started with this episode, we have a special announcement. As a regular listener, you know that the same technology that makes our jobs easier can also make things easier for cyber criminals. Given this, it's not surprising that enhancing cybersecurity is near the top of many organizations' to-do lists. What is surprising is how many businesses approach cyber risk management the wrong way. We want to help fix that at two Lunch and Learn webinars. So join us for the 10 biggest mistakes you're making with cyber risk and how to fix them. On the East Coast, we'll start on Wednesday, June 26th at noon. And on the West Coast, we'll start on Thursday, June 27th at noon. Invite your team members to join you in the conference room for this Lunch and Learn webinar. Registration to this exclusive 45-minute webinar and the Q&A session is free, but space is limited. Visit cyberriskmistakes.com to reserve your spot today. Now, on with the show. So, Kip, what are we going to talk about today? Hey, Jake, today we're going to talk about how there's a company in Scotland. They're suing an ex-employee because she was tricked into wiring over, get this, $260,000 to online criminals. Well, that's interesting. So what is the, uh, what's the specific charge there? Right. So she's in, she's in court or she's been in court and they're actually hearing the case now. And uh, so I, I read these BBC news articles. I don't actually have any access to the uh, court documents, right? So I'm getting this from the media. But apparently uh, there was this um, woman, her name is Patricia Riley, and the charge is that she acted negligently when she made unauthorized payments to these online criminals while she was working as a credit controller at a company called People's Media, which is a magazine publisher based in Scotland. And the, uh, the news article specifically said that the lawyers for Peebles, again, this is the employer, they, they claimed that Mrs. Riley's actions were, and, I, and here's the quote, careless and in breach of the duties, including the duty to exercise reasonable care in the course of the performance of her duties as an employee, which she owed to her employer, end quote. Interesting, interesting. So what does the company allege for the facts? And the reason that I asked that right away is negligence as a legal doctrine is almost entirely based on facts. I mean, the, the simple version of negligence is what you just kind of read, which is someone has a duty, they breached it, they cause damage. Yeah. So, Okay, so I, there were there were uh, two BBC news articles that I that I read, and th they were <laughs> they were just swimming in details, and, uh, and so rather than you know read the articles to you, I I just picked out the high points. So here's here's the stuff that stuck out to me as a chief information security officer. I wonder if you had read the articles, if if different things uh, might have stuck out to you. But here's here's what I saw. So first of all. This all went down in October of 2015, which I thought was interesting. That's, that's quite a delay, um, but this is Scotland and I don't really understand the legal system. But in October of 2015, Mrs. Riley, right, and she's the one being accused of negligence, she received a number of email messages which appeared to come from her boss. Her boss's name is Yvonne Bremner. And Yvonne Bremner is the managing director of People's Media, right? So Riley's the employee, Remner's the boss, and and all these fake emails came in saying, uh, you know, hi, this is this is Yvonne, please transfer money. All right, so it's a classic business email compromise attack. Yep. And and um, as is often the case, these emails came in to Mrs. Riley when Ms. Bremer Remner was on vacation in the Canary Islands. Right. So it's like. Obviously, this company was being surveilled by the cyber criminals for them to attack while 
the managing director was uh, physically thousands of miles away. Um, and this works a lot, right? Because we know from the FBI, um, the statistics are over 12 billion dollars in worldwide losses since 2013 to this kind of attack. Now it's interesting that the articles didn't actually say business email compromise, didn't really focus on the actual style of the attack, really didn't talk about um, you know, the classic pattern of the attack, but, but that's, that's absolutely um, you know, what's, what's going on here. So, so that's sort of the larger context, right? So Mrs. Bremner, the managing director, said uh, in court that Mrs. Riley was not authorized to make payments on behalf of the company, and the managing director said she never knew that Mrs. Riley was, was able to make payments, right? So, so the boss is alleging, like, how could she possibly issue these payments when nobody ever granted her access to the banking account? Yeah, that doesn't um, make a great deal of sense. No, this, it's, it's, really, it's, really, uh, it's really strange. Um, but here's an interesting point. Um, the, Mrs. Riley is, is also alleged when she was uh, doing the online banking transfers that she checked a box during, uh, like in the web browser, as she was authenticating to the bank and, and preparing the transactions, that there was a box that said, essentially, um, check here to acknowledge we are warning you as your bank that there are actively con artists attempting to fool employees in, into making false payments. And so, um, you know, apparently they've got, they've got evidence that Mrs. Riley or somebody using her credentials checked check that box, right? And so that's that's another piece of evidence that the company is bringing in here. And so um, the, the, the specific amount of the suit is $140,000 because apparently the bank uh, reimbursed some of the losses. The article doesn't really uh, say why. <laughs> but there's this... Um, but but then there's these these comments from the managing director Bremner. Uh, for example, she says, "quote I didn't particularly trust her. She was the office gossip, and that's why she was privy to nothing." End quote. <laughs> this is starting to sound very personal. I was going to say this is um, this is very interesting, uh, and you know. You said there were twelve billion in losses from the yeah. business email compromise, and she's responsible for what two hundred fifty thousand. Uh huh. So, you know, she's in. Uh, she's at least has a lot of company uh, in her misery. Right. Um, okay. So now, now the the facts are all. I've almost done. I just want. I just want to say two more things about, um, you know, what the what the company is saying in court about. Mrs. Riley. Okay. So the other two things are, um, is that the managing director Bremner said that Mrs. Riley was an underperformer at her job and allegedly did not bother chasing debtors who continually failed to pay people's media. Right. So, um, so it's not just, Hey, you, you screwed up and you, and you sent money that you were never supposed to send using a credentials that you were never supposed to have, but, but you know you're you're also untrustworthy. You're an office gossip. You you never did your 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 job correctly, and and ultimately Mrs. Riley was was fired uh, from from all of this. For you know f fired from her company for all of this. Which I understand, but but what did she say? What's what's her story? <clears throat> okay, so Mrs. Riley isn't saying nearly as much as the company, right? Uh, which I think is which I think is interesting. But what she is saying is first she's saying that she that she never received any training from the company People's Media about how to spot an online fraud, you know, and uh, and so she's like, well, you know, if you if you'd wanted me to to be on aware of this of this risk, you know, you should have you should have told me I should have received training. Um, so I'm not negligent, you know, because uh, you never told me what to do. So that's one thing she's saying. The other thing uh, her lawyers are saying is, is uh, I thought this was an interesting statement. Quote, uh, it, not, it, is, uh, it is not known and not admitted that she was presented with that warning screen from the bank. So she's saying like, uh, a, uh, that, I, never, that, I never saw it. Yeah, and that to me sounds like a, uh, a uh, kind of 
uh, almost ritualistic uh, type of statement. We have that in American law. They have it a lot more over in uh, in Britain. So that's that's almost certainly something that is said as a regular on a regular basis. Ah, okay. And, and I and all it means is no. <laughs> You know, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's kind playground of talk. <laughs> yeah. That's how I read that. Um, okay. And then the last thing uh, that she says is that she was so freaked out by what had happened, you know, this loss of money when it actually um, was disclosed that, that she had, um, you know, that, 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 the, that the money was, was gone. She testified, quote, I was driving to work the following morning and I started to panic. I had to stop the car and I almost passed out. I had to go to the doctors and I was prescribed diazepam, end quote. Which of course is a, uh, an interesting fact, but probably totally irrelevant to the lawsuit. <laughs> well, I thought that, I, again, it's like I'm reading this article and it, it almost sounds like a soap opera. Oh yeah. Right? I mean, and, and, I'm, and I'm struggling to like understand like what are the facts here and what is essentially, to my way of thinking, sand thrown in people's eyes, right? to kind of get them off the trail. But so I was really, really glad we we're talking about this during, during this episode, because, you know, as a lawyer, um, I'm hoping that you're going to help me sift through all this and not only figure out, you know, like what's legit in this particular case, but uh, there's a bigger question too, which is, is it a good idea for companies to sue their employees after a business email compromise? I mean, that's just one question I have, but you know, uh, take it away, Jake. What, what are you seeing here? So, uh, you know, one, uh, with the caveat that we only have a handful of BBC articles and, and I found some additional reporting on it. Uh, and we, we don't, we, we have a limited view of the facts. So, you know, let's, let's just kind of, uh, there's, there's our disclaimer for this conversation. Okay. Um, but based on what is in these articles, and there's quite a bit, um, it seems to me that I think you said it earlier. There's a little bit of of uh, its personal issues going on here. Um, I don't think that, generally speaking, it's a good idea for companies to sue their employees after a BEC. Um, the 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 fact is that business email compromise is a or certainly can be a highly sophisticated attack that is very convincing. And you don't get to 12 billion in BEC damages by being obvious or easy to spot. Right. So uh, I, I think that there is very much, you know, Hindsight is twenty twenty. You can always Monday morning quarterback. You know, pick whatever metaphor you <laughs> want. But, but it is um, once you learn that something is a scam, it's obviously very easy to go back and say, "Well, you should have known that was a scam." Well, right. Really, should they have? And you know what? You know who's responsible here? Um, she could say. Well, you know, she had her, one of her defenses is you didn't train me, which mm -hmm. I suppose is a, is a reasonable defense. Um, another one is, uh, you let me do this. I mean, where were the systems and procedures in place to prevent money from being sent out, uh, you know, in this type of instance, mm. so, you know, that you just can't blame, you know, a BEC is not, a, is not one person's fault, really. Um, yeah. After all, who are the bad guys targeting? I mean, they're targeting the, they're, they're targeting people and they're going to try to find people who are, you know, most susceptible to this. Right. So, and, and they're going to use the, and, and again, just to remind listeners, a business email compromise is not an attack against a technological defense, right? It's not about compromising a firewall or, um, or, you know, or, or any real technology. It's really about the oldest, you know, sort of, um, you know, uh, attack in the book, which is uh, a con. I mean, this is just, you know, this is just a, a flat out con um, conducted, you know, through electronic means. But, but the basic premise of this is, you know, I'm going to emotionally manipulate somebody. 
Yeah. And, and they trick you. And let's right. be honest, you know, I, even the smartest people can fall for scams. That's, they're good at what they do. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if we've talked about it uh, here on this podcast. I don't think so. But recently I saw an, an article that, um, that there was, there was a fellow um, uh, in Europe and he conned over a multi-year period something like a hundred million dollars of of um of money from the likes of google and facebook he he scammed them by setting up a fake company and sent fake invoices for high-end servers and other networking equipment and never delivered any of it and um and and all these bills were paid <laughs> if you can scam Google and Facebook, uh, you know, what, you know, what, what is poor Mrs. Riley? You know, how could she possibly defend herself? Well, I, I mean, I, I, that's, that's the good point. And I think that uh, there's, there's a, there's a real issue, I think, with, with this negligence uh, claim, because what it says is, um, employee, you have a duty to exercise, quote, reasonable care under the circumstances to prevent scam artists from stealing money. And if you think about what that really is saying, it's putting the entirety of the defense against this form of cyber attack, the BBC, mm-hmm. on one person and collapsing it down to a simple negligence theory. And I think that I think that's unreasonable um, because I know that the level of sophistication of these types of attacks is high. That, that well, things that we say all the time: cybersecurity is a team sport. Mm-hmm. No single person's, uh, you know, duty. Um, and really, you know, this, this, this woman here was at least three layers down, uh, just reading from the, reading the facts in the articles in the management, uh... in in the management. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and is this the person that you're going to put in charge of, of defending the entire company from, from cybersecurity scams? Because that's really what they're saying. You had a duty to not be tricked by any scam, this type of scam in particular, and you didn't exercise reasonable care. Um, I just find that to be uh, a very uh, unrealistic and unreasonable standard to put on a, uh, you know, a, a possibly low level. I can't quite tell. I don't know how big this company is low to mid level person. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, where was the CISO? Why isn't the CISO, you know, responsible for this, this BEC? Um, I think that if, I think this is a really dangerous case because if the, if the employer wins, I mean, fortunately it's over in Scotland and the U S courts, you know, don't have to pay even the slightest attention to it, Mm -hmm. but let's just say that if the defend or if the, if the defendant loses, so if the employer wins, then you have at least one international case precedent that says it is the employee's fault for not spotting a business email compromise. Right. And to me, that is, you know, one thing that we talk about in First Amendment law, which of course they don't have over in in Britain, is uh, the idea of chilling speech, Mm. right? And one of the the things that the First Amendment is meant to do is is protect speech, uh, you know, almost, uh, always in mm-hmm. you know, very, very strong level of protection because we're very scared of chilling speech, chilling right. discussion. Well, this is going to be like chilling all business activity ever because mm-hmm. what employee is going to take the risk of paying a bill or responding to an email if they think, Oh, well, if I'm wrong, then I could get sued for whatever loss I cause. Right. And, you know, you're setting up all the wrong, you're setting up all the wrong things here. 
Um, well, and that would effectively throw a lot of sand in the gears of commerce, right? Because oh, it would. Pe people would be stepping back from taking on that responsibility. And so as companies are invoicing each other, even, you know, for legitimate stuff, right? Because business email compromises is, is some, you know, percentage of a larger legitimate um, c commercial activity, but you know, those bills aren't going to get paid very, very quickly and it's going to slow everything down. It will slow everything down. It, it is, uh, it puts the responsibility on the wrong party. Um, you know, you, you can't reasonably request every person in an organization to spot every scam, every attack. Right. Um, you know, so here's the, here's a question. You know, if I take this to the next step, then, you know, wouldn't it be the IT department's negligence if someone gets in and, and exfiltrates data? I mean, they have a right. duty to stop that from happening and, you know, they breached it. So, and they caused me damage. So I'm going to hold those IT guys personally liable. And as a business, I'm going to sue my own employees. I think well, this is just a terrible idea. The more I talk about it, the more convinced I am that this is <laughs> perhaps one of the worst ideas I have ever heard. Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting because we've had years and years and years of data breaches, credit card compromises, right? Think about Target, think about Home Depot, and nobody, right, on any of those teams, to the best of my understanding, were, you know, that there was any attempt to hold them, you know, legally accountable, right, in a, in a civil action, um, <clears throat> not, you know, and certainly not a criminal action, um, to, you know, to hold them accountable for what, for what happened. And, and I think, um, you know, you, you, using this case, you could say, well, you know, we, we could have tried to sue employees or entire teams of people who had been given hundreds of millions of dollars in budget to buy firewalls and, um, and all kinds of technological defenses um, to become PCI compliant. But none of that stuff actually uh, prevented um, those, those credit card uh, compromises and and so I mean there certainly has been plenty of opportunity for a uh, uh, a suit like this to arise but this is the first one I've heard of well so in in America and I, I don't know what the law is over in uh, in Europe or, or Britain um, but you know one of the things that may and I'm not an employment lawyer keep that in mind but one of the things that that I do know is that you know under agency theory Let's say, uh, uh, you know, if a UPS driver uh, in his UPS truck is driving along and gets into a car accident, then uh, the person who was hit can sue UPS uh, because the driver of the truck was acting on, you know, company orders. Mm -hmm. As an agent. Yeah. As an agent. You know, they were in the, it was in the course of employment. Mm -hmm. So I think there might be... Uh, I think that one of the reasons you've never seen this before is that there's there's really no mechanism to hold an employee accountable like this uh, when they're just doing their job. Uh, I also think that it would be um, I think it would be I think there's a lot of reasons it would be very hard to do uh, under American law, but but I I don't. I don't, I'm not a hundred percent confident in that. So, mm -hmm. so I we just, could see a suit like this in you could, the United States. You could see a suit like this in the United States. Um, I think it's a bad idea. I think that, uh, I think that the risk of people becoming, you know, extremely paranoid and being unwilling to take any useful action would shut down commerce mm -hmm. uh, or at mm -hmm. the very least, as you put it, throw quite a bit of sand into yeah. the view. Okay, so and, you so you think the chilling effect on the overall economy and a, and a reticence by company by individuals to put themselves in jeopardy, um, uh, you you think that would be uh, consequences that are un um, unacceptable, uh, you, you know, it, uh, as a result of holding uh, a few individuals accountable, even if they were yeah. even if they were negligent. Well, and I think at the bottom line is is that it it, it just isn't. I don't think that the way that the way you'd have to state the duty to claim a breach uh -huh. is, is just not reasonable. I mean, you would, in order to make this case, you would have to say that every individual employee has an individual duty to spot and defend against 
cyber attacks. Yeah. Right. And I, as security professionals, that's to us, that's just nuts. Um, well, but, but I don't know. I mean, let me challenge that for a second because, um, you know, we have talked about, you know, cyber is a team sport. Um, we do have um, a whole segment of the cybersecurity market space that is de de devoted to training uh, individual people about how to spot and not fall for phishing attacks, right? There's a whole, a whole sub industry around uh, training people uh, in this way. So, so we do expect them, right? We do train them and we do expect them to not click on links. So I'm wondering like, where's the line, right? Between, well, we're gonna train you and we're gonna expect this from you, but if you end up doing it anyway, well, we're not gonna sue you, right? We could sanction you with some kind of internal company disciplinary process, right? You could, you could get fired. And right. that's and that's fine. But I think the line between suing someone for the damages and discipline or or terminating their employment is is a pretty thick one. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I, I'm not saying that 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 we shouldn't train people. Uh, in fact, I would say that you know you you must train your employees. Mm -hmm. But even if they're fully trained, nothing is foolproof and right. and how do you determine um you know i suppose you could i suppose if you really wanted to uh if you could dev if you could show a factual record full of of training and that the person uh you know understood it and did it and took little tests uh -huh. and if you could show that the specific phishing attempt that led to the bec was so obvious that no reasonable person would fall for it. Maybe you could make a case. Uh, a different factual pattern, by the way, that I think might change my decision somewhat is: mm. let's say the person, let's say the, let's say the company mandates training, uh -huh. but what if the person doesn't do it, or they, uh, you know, they were behind in their training and they and the system hadn't caught up to them yet? I mean, mm. there are there are factual patterns you can conceive of where this becomes more or less appropriate, you know, more appropriate than, than it is right now. But overall, not to kind of continue to beat this, this horse is that businesses probably should not be suing their employees for business email compromises. You know, defending against that is def it, it, like everything it's defense in depth, right? You need to have a multi-layered approach, uh, putting all, you know, putting the entire duty of care, on every individual line employee uh, is is not only is it not realistic, but uh, you know this particular BEC wasn't that much money. You know, maybe she has that much money that could be recovered. Yeah. But what if it's a million dollar BEC, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, or a hundred million dollars. Or a hundred million dollar, right? I mean, how, how many how many how many line employees are going to be able to, you know, how many how many white employees could afford to, you know, to well, nobody, nobody, I mean, really. right? yeah. nobody. I mean, and it's, it's really not about getting the money back. I think in this case, it's really about uh, saying, you know, it's about sending a message, right. A deterrent, you know, like you said, a chilling effect, right. But to send a deterrent message, like, Hey, all of you who didn't get sued, be, be careful, be on notice, right. That you could. And Mrs. Riley, uh, one of the things I didn't mention yet, but uh, she was also quoted as saying that um, ever since she was fired from her job, um, she hasn't been able to uh, become gainfully employed uh, because she is responsibly disclosing that she is the subject of a lawsuit and nobody will take her on. Um, and so, you know, economically, uh, you know, her life is uh, in, in a really bad uh, situation. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I mean, so if as an employee, you know, if I was an employee, I would be looking at this and I would say, even if I'm vindicated in a court of law, I don't want to spend three to four years um, you know, going to the food pantry because I can't get a job. Well, and let's, and, and let's face it. If, if you know your employer is li is potentially going to sue you for this, you're going to find a different job. I just, well, I, I would, I would think so, I mean, I but, think but, it, but it's rough, right? I mean, it's hard, you know, to, to wait this out. Okay. So the conclusion that you're at is, um, companies don't sue your employees, right? That's, that's the message you're sending to our audience of senior decision makers like you know don't just this is not a good idea 
uh, you know, you're encouraging them not to do it. And my bottom line is, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have expectations of them. You should, you should still train them. You should still, you know, think of this uh, cyber risk management as a team sport. But I think what we're saying is, is that the, is that the line um, that you should be uh, drawing when you sanction somebody for, you know, for not uh, protecting the company against a business email compromise is going to be some internal disciplinary manner up, in, up to and including termination of employment. We just don't think that these people should be drug into a court of law. Does that, does that pretty much sum it up? That sums it up pretty well. Okay. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Today, we talked about how a company in Scotland is suing an ex-employee because she was tricked into wiring over $260,000 to online criminals. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for joining us today on the Cyber Risk Management Podcast. Remember that cyber risk management is a team sport and should incorporate management, your legal department, HR, and IT for full effectiveness. Management's goal should be to create an environment where practicing good cyber hygiene is supported and encouraged by every employee. So if you want to manage your cyber risks and ensure that your company enjoys the benefits of good cyber hygiene, then please contact us and consider becoming a member of our Cyber Risk Business Strategy Program. Find out more by visiting us at cyberriskopportunities.com and newmanlaw.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.